the Iowa caucus. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about it because it's it's a unique place to start. It's not like an election like you normally think of. Um, if you try to apply the logic of an election to a caucus, you will only wind up annoyed and probably wrong. So we just actually wanted to take some time, um, run through what's going to be happening on Monday night when the results start coming in from this race we've been talking about for it seems ever. Um, just think about it. It's actually a couple of thousand well 1700 caucuses individually at the precinct level all around the state of iowa um and for the first time they're actually going to be doing a number of them outside of iowa there'll be some caucuses in florida and arizona for the snowbirds and they're actually going to be i believe three international locations uh glasgow scotland paris france and the really interesting one tbilisi georgia so we've confirmed that they're allowing non-citizens to vote then. <laughs> what it turned out, because I, I had a conversation with the people of the Iowa Democrats, and I said, Tbilisi, Georgia? And it turns out there's um, some sort of exchange program or something, so there are a number of college students there. Kind of unclear how many people will actually be showing up to these satellite caucuses throughout the country and you know Europe and Western Asia. Um, but that's the plan. Part of this is a DNC mandate to be more inclusive because caucuses, again, another way they're not like a regular voting thing where you have, you know, six in the morning to nine at night. You just stop in and, you know, anywhere from five minutes to an hour later, you're done, depending on the line. In a caucus, you actually have to show up at a specific time. They will be closing the doors at 7 p.m. Central time, theoretically, depending on, you know, they have to process people to come in. And then what happens is you're committed to probably a good half hour, 45 minutes to vote. Um, they do some party business. They read a letter from the state chairman. And then you don't just fill out a ballot like you normally would. You actually have to go stand in a group with other supporters of your candidate. And they're calling this the first alignment. And what happens is they'll tally up the vote. Somebody will go around and count the people standing in the groups together. And they know the total number of people at the caucus for that precinct. And if you don't get 15%, you're what they call non-viable or that candidate's non-viable. So then they stop. And the people in the non-viable groups have a couple of choices. They can either try and get more people to join their group from another non-viable group. They can join one that was already viable by meeting that 15% mark, or um, they can remain uncommitted. In the past, you used to be able to get people in from the from a viable group but they're not allowing that anymore. So what's gonna happen is if you vote for say Joe Biden and he has 18%, then you're done. You can go home. You hand in a card because they wanna have a paper trail this year and you're done. But the people that were with a non-viable have to stick around for a second vote and they're calling that the final alignment. And that's going to be another set of numbers, which they've never released before, by the way. They've never released raw vote totals. Now they're going to release Two sets of raw vote totals and a third set called state delegate equivalents. Alex, would you, Alex Aldunson, would you like to talk about state delegate equivalents? Because I know this is your your passion. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's it's the act of taking the seventeen hundred caucuses and allocating forty one delegates out of that. Okay, it there's a formula for it. Um, I'm not sure that even the Iowa Democratic Party fully understands the formula for it. Um, but at the end of the day, what ends up happening is you aggregate together the results of all of those caucuses and spit out, you know, the, the allocation of the 41 pledge delegates that Iowa produces. Um, and those are technically the results that matter um, going forward. I say technically because a lot of this will not really, the delegate allocation won't be what matters mathematically. Um, we'll, we'll talk about polling in a second, but it looks like the delegates are probably, you know, no one's going to, no one's going to really take 30 out of the 41 delegates. No one's really going to build a lead in Iowa. Um, and so really what will matter uh, for the future contest is, well, what's the narrative around, around Iowa? Who really won? Um, if you recall back in 2016, um, Cruz won. Trump came in second. 
um, and Rubio came in third unexpectedly. He had a, a surge. And so the narrative was, you know, Ted Cruz sort of unexpectedly comes from behind and wins the Iowa caucus. And also Marco Rubio won the Iowa caucus. <laughs> um, of course, Iowa and New Hampshire often deviate from each other. And so uh, a little over a week later, uh, Trump wins New Hampshire and starts running away with the nomination and pretty much nothing that happened in, in Iowa mattered. Um, so the delegates don't matter. It's more about the, the narrative here. Um, but it is important to get the delegate count right. Um, and yeah. And that you talk about the narrative and there's actually the potential for three narratives. Somebody could say, hey, I won the first one. I'm the most popular among all Iowa Democrats. You know, you can see that happening. And then when yep. the second alignment, the final alignment comes out, that first person that wasn't the second choice of enough people. So they slip to second. Somebody goes from second or third to first. And they say, no, I'm the winner. I have, you know, I have the most votes. Now, the way the state delegate equivalents are, are allocated to the precincts, it's possible that somebody will have more state delegate equivalents then the person has final vote. So it's sort of a electoral college situation where somebody could theoretically win the popular vote in the final alignment, but actually somebody else wins the delegate equivalents and therefore the actual delegate numbers. So yeah, yeah it's a, it's and, a little and, different. And in the past, and in the past, some, you know, a few things that have happened are on election night, there seems to be a winner. And then when they, and there's an estimated delegate count, on election night and then when they actually sit down with the final numbers and, and calculate it out turns out you know different candidate actually won um, so that's also fun yeah and something also to understand we're not actually going to do what we normally do at decision desk which is project the winner um, because we are collecting the, the results ourselves this is all this is a private party this is a really big Elks Club election um, so they're going to tell us what happened and, and we're going to pass it on. They're not going to declare an official winner, but they're urging people to use the state delegate equivalent metric. So that's what we'll do when they tell us that, that, that number out and that's who will get the check mark at the end of the night. But yeah, there have been adjustments in the past, which, you know, really thrills people. Um, it doesn't lead to any problems at all ever. And, you know, that's in a head-to-head -head field. This is a field where there could be three or four candidates that, are again, could, could lay claim to something. And it's just going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Probably going to be a bit of a long night. Uh, we plan to be here with one of our, our live streams as well, talking about it as much as we can. Um, but, yeah, it did, and as Alex said, too, is like New Hampshire will probably be different. So everybody will focus on this for... 16 hours and then 12 other things will happen and we'll all move on to New Hampshire. The roadshow will go on, but that's really the outline of Iowa. It's unlike anything else. And I think the real big takeaway here is hold the call. hold the primary. It's just a lot easier. People understand it. Um, but they hold the caucus because, you know, Hey, um, we have to uh, we have to start somewhere, and they don't want to start a war between Iowa and New Hampshire. If Iowa hey. ever held a primary, it would get ugly. Hey, Drew, we just got a call that you've now been banned from the state of Iowa. Wow, that would really cut into all the tips I have never made there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, what I'm sure it's a lovely place. I'm sure it's lovely, and they're fine people. <sighs> They've been very helpful. So, Drew, what's our, opinion, what's our opinion on, like, look, I, I, some of us have been through the 2016 Republican one, these caucuses. I, I always find it interesting. People think these things are, you know, they don't understand. They understand the difference between a caucus and a primary in the sense that a caucus, you show up to a place and you vote as a group in a primary. Um, you know, you show up at a ballot box. That's usually where the knowledge stops. Um, but I don't think most people realize a caucus is not run by any state entity. It is run by a party. It is, it is the equivalent of a slumber party in terms of elections. You don't know what's going to happen. We don't make the rules. We don't decide how it is, whereas at least a primary is run by state election officials who are nonpartisan. Is that, is that our opinion that um, you know these things could have issues in terms of reporting just because they're, they're run? Basically what I'm saying is are we thinking there are going to be hiccups on Monday night? 
I think there's a very good chance, as Got you know, it. we were talking a little bit, um, you know, that happened in the past about the numbers and when they come out and oops, we found this. You know, they're relying on party volunteers, and it's not nefarious. It's not oh, they're stealing it from him or she's getting screwed by this. You know, turnout's going to be really big. Um, people are excited about it. People are interested. People are plugged in by all reports. They're going to show up. This is something that happens once every four years. It's run by volunteers on a one-off basis. There's having to get these votes. And this is what we do. So if we know how hard and complex it is to collect these votes, collate them, and report them out. If it's not something you're used to doing and you're dealing with volunteers who are doing it once every four years or for the first time ever, um, you know, there's a lot of places where things could go wrong. There's reports that they're using some sort of phone app that to get the results from the precinct level up to somewhere. I'm not sure if it's, you know, is, is the phone app connected directly to a database? Is it going to somebody else? How many potential failure points are there in there? How tested is the system? You just don't know. You guys could speak to this a little more. Um, Microsoft was involved four years ago, supposedly to supply um, an API so that the results could be uh, disseminated. And the system didn't work, and Microsoft walked away. They were supposed to do Nevada, and they said, no, you people are crazy in politics. <laughs> um, and, you know, so if a company like Microsoft, which has all the resources in the world, kind of threw up their hands on it, you know, yeah. we can only sort of hope for the best. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think you're going to see a lot of stories come out, too, around, like, security around these things. You bring up the walk app and things like that, like... I th honestly think the you know the probability is pretty low that a foreign entity wants to screw with the Iowa caucus. We can that should be the topic of another thing. But like security in the sense of you know tricksters wanting to screw around and try and vote ten times, or some you know high school kid messing around, or someone loses um, some sort of tally of votes or something like that. I think that that's high, and obviously the media is going to be looking into that as they should, as well as the authorities. I, 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 the chances of some sort of weird happening on Monday night, I think, are decently high. Um, yeah. I don't think it's going to be Putin trying to pick Bernie Sanders as a winner, but, um, you know, we're going to see something happen on Monday night. I think that's something everyone should kind of be aware of. Yeah, um, even even without the idea of bad actors involved, I just yeah. think, you know, yeah. well-meaning people having problems. That's one reason they did add this idea about preference cards. Yeah. So that everybody has to turn in so there's, for the first time, some sort of paper trail. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than just, you know, the 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 local precinct captain turning in the paper saying, well, this is what I saw, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's why we're going to wait um, until the party tells us stuff because there's just, again, not nefarious. There's just no, there's no way that we have any ability to control for anything. So we're just going to wait till the people that are responsible and sort of own the event tell us what, what they have.